Well, we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Leah Rand, and along with Dr. Aaron Kesselheim, we convened this Health Policy and Bioethics Consortia series with the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law, and also through the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School and the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard Law School. And we're excited to welcome you today for a discussion of the ethics and access to assisted reproductive therapies or technology, excuse me. And so quickly to go through the overview of the consortium objectives, um, first to thank you for joining us, sorry, um, some housekeeping. Please submit any questions you have using the Q&A feature. So that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please put them into the Q&A box um, and you're welcome to use the chat box for any technical questions you might have or issues. Um, and you're also welcome to tweet about this if this is something you do using our hashtag policy ethics. Um, and the video of this event will be posted up on the Center for Bioethics YouTube page in a few weeks. Um, and you're also welcome to subscribe to future events through the Center for Bioethics, um, as well as Portal's email list. So the objectives of the uh, Policy and Bioethics Consortium are to think about key issues in healthcare systems and public health, um, what their ethical implications are, and to bring together experts with different perspectives on these issues to discuss what they are and as well as propose solutions. And we hope that this will stimulate conversation as well as uh, think about future directions of research that we can advance the health policy field in. And I also want to flag for your attention our upcoming session. The final one of the year will be on April 8th, and we'll be looking at uh, financing and political commitments for pu public health. But for today, I'm going to hand it over to our moderator, Beatrice Brown, who's a research specialist with Portal. Uh, B received her BA in Ethics, Politics, and Economics from Yale University and her Master's of Bioethics from Harvard Medical School. During her Master's, B was a student fellow at the Petrie Flom Center for Health, Law, Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. And some of her research interests include reproductive health care and its intersections with ethics and law, as well as the effects of risk evaluation and mitigation strategy programs on patient access to prescription drugs. So her work with Portal has been published in Annals of Internal Medicine, the AMA Journal of Ethics, Health Affairs, JAMA Network Open, and JAMA Internal Medicine, and she'll be attending law school this coming fall. So we're pleased to have her moderating today's discussion. Um, and over to you, B. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, so I'll just be providing a quick overview of what exactly assisted reproductive technologies are, as well as a broad overview of the issues before handing it over to our two wonderful speakers for today. So to start off with what these technologies are, it can be an ambiguous term in terms of what assisted reproductive technologies covers. Um, some have proposed narrow definitions. So for instance, the CDC has based their definition on the 1992 Fertility Clinic Success Rate and Certification Act, which only includes treatments in which um, the eggs are surgically removed, combined with sperm in the lab, and then returned to either the woman's body who the eggs were retrieved from or to another woman. And this definition excludes um, techniques such as artificial insemination or simply stimulating egg production in a woman. However, assisted reproductive technologies can also be construed more broadly as any medical technique that is used to achieve pregnancy beyond sexual intercourse. So that would include both artificial insemination, for example, as well as uh, intrauterine insemination. Regardless of what definition is used, assisted reproductive technologies can be extremely expensive. So for example, um, one cycle of in vitro fertilization or IVF can cost between $12,000 to $17,000 on average. And given that very high cost, there are unfortunately barriers to access for those who are less well off, which raises the question of whether or not um, assisted reproductive technologies should be only accessible to those who can pay or is there some sort of moral or legal right to procreate? 17 states now in the United States require insurance companies to cover infertility treatment. There are also two states, California and Texas, that have laws that require insurance companies to offer this coverage, but not necessarily that the treatment do be covered. So for example, in California, employers can decide themselves whether or not to provide the coverage to their employees that are covered on that health insurance. Even when there is coverage, these state insurance mandates vary substantially, leading to a patchwork of laws in the United States. 
And even when infertility treatment is covered, there may still be access issues for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> so for example, some laws do not require that IVF be covered, or if they do, they only cover a certain number of cycles or require that another treatment even be tried first, even if that may not make medical sense for a particular patient. Additionally, other states, for example, may require a certain definition of infertility to be met, which can preclude certain individuals, such as those who are single or same-sex couples, from obtaining coverage for these expensive services. This raises a host of issues and questions that we're hoping to tackle today. For example, what are some of the ways that access to assisted reproductive technologies can be improved? How can we ensure that there is just access and ethical distribution of these technologies? what barriers may remain, and what potential novel challenges lie ahead. We're really lucky today to be joined by two experts in this topic to discuss this very topic. Um, first, we will have Dean Judith Dar, who is the Dean of the Chase College of Law at Northern Kentucky University and a professor of law there as well. Her scholarship sits at the intersection of law, medicine, and ethics, and she is recognized as one of the leading experts in assisted reproductive technologies. Her most recent book, The New Eugenics, Selective Breeding in an Era of Reproductive Technologies, warns how unequal access to these technologies may come to resemble the past atrocities of the eugenics movement in the United States. Professor Dar also served as chair of the Ethics Committee of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine from 2014 to 2020. Next, we'll be joined by Dr. Elia Dashi, who is a professor of medical science at the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University, where he also previously served as the Dean of Medicine and Biological Sciences. Dr. Adashi's extensive scholarship focuses on reproduction, medicine, science, public health, law, bioethics, and human rights. And among his many achievements, he has served in leadership roles for multiple professional societies and organizations focused on healthcare and reproductive medicine, including as president of the American Gynecological and Obstetrical Society. He has also been a member of multiple National Academy of Medicine consensus committees and reports on reproductive medicine. Really excited for this discussion today, and I will turn it over to you, Dean Dar. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, B, and thank you, Leah and Aaron, for including me and Ellie. I'm just grateful to be in your shadow. I'm really <laughs> delighted to be here, and thank you for this opportunity. I'll go ahead and share my screen, and then we can get started with our slides. Um, I'm coming to you today from Nashville, where we're here for the law school for an alumni event, and uh, I'm excited to, to be able to join uh, through this uh, wonderful, I guess, sometimes terrible technology we call Zoom. Uh, go ahead and start my slideshow. Thanks, everyone. Well, thanks, B, so much for that wonderful framing and to providing so many important foundational issues and facts. And I'll just begin by saying that, yes, we are here to talk about technology and advances in uh, assisted reproductive technologies, but let's not forget that there's still a human quality to how we make babies. And I always feel that the, that gets short shrifted. So um, just to update the way that people meet and are introduced, we'll begin uh, with Mr. Spur meeting Ms. Egg. I mean, that does seem to be the way that uh, the world is going and increasingly uh, that uh, reproduction is unfolding. Well, again, thanks to B for, for creating these definitions. And I'd like to add just a, a word or two about that. Um, as, as B mentioned, I know in my scholarship, I take a broader view of ART than does the CDC, for example, uh, and, it would, and would include a basket of medical techniques used to achieve pregnancy by means other than sexual intercourse. So yes, that would include IVF, but it would also include, as, as B mentioned, ways in which the sperm is introduced to the egg, sometimes inside the body so that there's no need to extract uh, the oocytes in a surgical procedure. And just to update ART, uh, we'll talk a moment about the way in which this field is growing and changing. Uh, and that are techniques that are applied to gametes or early stage embryos to promote the health of a resulting offspring. And so that piece is going to figure in a little bit to my talk today, but certainly it looms in terms of access to these technologies. And I'll, I'll mention them specifically as we move on. 
Well, let's meet our founder in ways, Louise Brown. This is the cover of her book that she authored upon her 40th birthday in 2018. So Louise turns 44 this summer. Uh, it's hard to believe that IVF is middle age, but depending on your definition, it appears to be the case. Louise was the first human being to be conceived and born alive using in vitro fertilization. She was born outside of London in July of 1978. So she's really our patient zero, if you will, in the field. And from Louise, we've certainly come a long way in 40 plus years. This just shows a bit of the epidemiology surrounding uh, ART. So just looking at the most recent figures published by the CDC, which are published annually according to the federal law that we mentioned, the 1992 Act, we collect very specific data on cycles of IVF. Um, I rounded the numbers a bit, but in 2019, the most recent year, because of course there is a collection period and then there's a lag period from when the, the treatment is secured and the results are known typically 40 weeks later. Uh, but in that year, we had about 84,000 babies born through IVF. The TDI or therapeutic donor insemination is really an estimate. Um, we don't know exactly how many children are born in the United States through donor insemination because we don't collect figures on that, uh, but we think it's around 60,000. If you put these numbers together, ART accounts for over 3% of all U.S. births. And it's, so, it, it's very significant in the way that we form our families. Worldwide, we have over 8 million and counting children born through IVF. And the success rates on average, and there's so many variations in terms of uh, the treatment and uh, diagnosis and so on, but overall we have about a 35% success rate per cycle. Uh, and so again, you can see the attraction for this technology. There's increasing use of donor eggs and embryos. Egg freezing occupies a significant portion of cycles these days. You can see 20% of cycles are just for egg freezing. Uh, and then also I'll talk very briefly about pre-implantation genetic testing and its multiple uses and some of the ethical dilemmas that PGT raises for us. Just looking ahead briefly, these are some of the emerging technologies that are going to cap be captured a bit in my talk about access, but wanted to give you a sense about what's on the horizon. And some on the call may be very steeped in this, and I, and I, I give my hat to you uh, for help and just to acknowledge your work in the field. Mitochondrial replacement therapy is a technology that's used to overcome mitochondrial disease. Uh, and is moving forward very slowly, if at all, in the United States based on our regulatory scheme, more so in other countries, particularly in the UK and a few others. In vitro gametogenesis is a technology that hasn't reached the clinical phase in human trials, but it's a technology in which somatic cells uh, are sort of reversed engineers back to a stem state in which they can be then coaxed into uh, any number of cell lines, including gametes. So the idea would be that an individual through, let's say a blood cell or a skin cell um, could have that extracted, could have it reverse engineered, if you will, back to the stem state and then coaxed into becoming a gamete, either an egg or a sperm or perhaps both from a single individual. So leading to multiplex parenting and lots of configurations uh, in parenting that we really haven't considered to date. And then of course, germline gene editing, which made its way into the national dialogue in November of 19, of, sorry, 2018, uh, when Chinese scientists announced to a world gathering, and I was in the audience, so this is pictures from my iPhone, um, of uh, He Jianhui announcing that he had edited the genome for two, at this time, two female uh, twins who were born to a Chinese couple uh, in order to create uh, an opportunity to avoid infection with HIV. You might remember that it certainly got a lot of attention on the national stage. And you can see in the slide kind of in the upper middle portion, that crush of uh, media that was there when he made his presentation. It's interesting because when he finished, the Chinese military marched onto the stage and ushered him off and essentially hasn't been seen in public since. But it really did launch and start a debate about the ethics of emerging reproductive technologies, which we continue to engage in to this day. And then finally, just coming back to our country, I like to mention that stem cell research, uh, which is related in part to the genome editing slide that I just showed, um, remains of interest in the political arena. This past November, for example, California 
voters actually uh, passed this Prop 14, which would, as you can see, add $5.5 billion for medical research in, in the stem cell arena in California, following up on an initiative uh, that had expired uh, 10 years prior. But again, my point here is that popular support does seem to continue for research, at least therapeutic research in the field. And so it's captured um, in this question of access. Well, I always like to put this slide on for the, the lawyers in the group, and then just as a matter of general information about how the law interacts with ART. And to understand that, we really have to travel back way in time to the height of World War II, when a case reached the United States Supreme Court challenging an Oklahoma law that provided as punishment for certain criminals sexual sterilization. Uh, and Jack Skinner, who was the defendant in that case, challenged the constitutionality of the Oklahoma Criminal Habitual Sterilization Act by saying that it was simply unfair under constitutional language to force him to be sterilized through a vasectomy because he had committed certain, in that case, property crimes. Justice Douglas, writing the opinion for the court, agreed and declared the law unconstitutional. And in that case, we have very broad language about the meaning and import of procreation from a constitutional standpoint. Here, Justice Douglas, you see, calls procreation a basic civil right, a basic liberty. And these words, civil right and liberty, are very meaningful to the law and, of course, to us as individuals in the way that our intimate conduct is governed and um, moves forward in a legal state. We'll come back to Justice Douglas. But uh, moving forward, when I teach this to my students, I always have them pause and think about, well, what did Justice Douglas know about reproduction in 1942? What did he think about it? And certainly he didn't know about IVF. It was many decades before that would come about. Even insemination was really not on the medical front at that point. So this broad pronouncement about the importance of protecting procreation and procreational choices from the law you know, or prohibitions in the law um, is all we have. That's the only language we have from the Supreme Court. It's the only time that they've ever talked about affirmative rights to engage in reproduction. And so today, uh, we don't know how the court would respond to the doctor's question or the patient's question, are you sure it's mine? And this comic is, way, is meant to show um, that there are many, you can see the, uh, the background, there are many ways in which a pregnant person can give birth to a child in which that child would not be hers, at least from a legal family law framework. She could be a surrogate who had been paid $35,000 to carry the embryo for an individual or a couple. And in most states in the United States, she would have no rights and it would not be hers, if you will, um, in any legal sense. What would Justice Douglas say about that? Is it acceptable to regulate surrogacy? A few states actually ban commercial surrogacy. Is that uh, constitutional under his framework. Here, there's a conversation in which one uh, schoolgirl says to another, uh, basically, if grades were so important, then my parents should have paid for a smarter egg donor. There's lots of controversy surrounding egg donation. Uh, should it be commercialized? Should there be limits on how many cycles any particular woman can go through? What are the uh, regulations surrounding egg banking and so on? We have no sense about that from the court. There's transparenting. Uh, and we have many uh, pregnancy capable people uh, who can move forward. And here you see uh, a trans man and his, uh, I think husband, I'm not sure for sure in this photo, but the question is, um, what is the birth certificate going to say about this child's uh, parentage? Are there two fathers? Is there parent one, parent two? Um, and these dilemmas have come up in the law and, and we need to think about how the law responds to these um, new ways in which family formation is moving forward. Well, with that sort of background, I do wanna to talk to the main, move to the main topic, which are barriers. And B talked about cost, and of course we can't move forward with the barrier discussion without prominence in the cost area. But as you can see, I've listed a number of other ways in which there are barriers to accessing these marvelous technologies. And so very quickly, um, you can see from my points there, I have several to cover, so I'll do it um, very quickly. 
But cost, of course, is really a primary barrier to access. And the average cycle cost uh, should slightly different numbers, but it's in the ballpark, 12,000 to 19,000. And for this reason, treatment seeking, seeking in the US is very low. Uh, for a developed country. We only have about 50% of individuals who could benefit from IVF, even beginning the journey to think about it. In other countries where insurance is more robust, treatment seeking is much higher. And again, um, I know Ellie's gonna talk at length about insurance coverage, so I'll leave that to him. But basically the bottom line is that mostly IVF is self-pay, about 85% of it is self-pay. Um, the 19 states that be mentioned that require it, either uh, require to cover or offer to cover, again, not really penetrating uh, the majority. And also when you dig in, you'll see that some of the coverage is very slim. Uh, and, and so it doesn't necessarily mean that 19 out of 50 states are actually covering these techniques. We're seeing a little bit of breakthrough in private industry who is trying to attract younger talent, female talent, and they're beginning to fill the, the void a bit by offering coverage. And I, I call it the technification of uh, ART because it really did start in tech, the large tech companies, Apple, Google, and so on. And it is catching a bit of uh, wind. And so we might see some improvements in that and just in the industry itself. And just as an aside for law, federal laws are really not helpful. And we can have a discussion afterward about whether we should think about a federal law. But right now, ERISA, uh, which is a longstanding, now 50-year-old, perhaps more, um, federal law that governs employee benefits. Um, it, it allows for the state mandates that do require insurance sometimes to be preempted in a variety of ways. And then the ACA, I know way back when, when the Obama administration was talking about it, I and others at ASRM uh, lobbied hard to get uh, infertility treatment as a covered benefit under the ACA, but that, alas, did not happen. Well, let's talk about other barriers. Um, race and ethnicity are barriers to ART in some unique and, and I think interesting ways. We're probably all on the call familiar with the Institute of Medicine report that documents disparities in, in access to healthcare and to clinical outcomes along racial and ethnic lines. That's well known. So there's no surprise that that's the case as well in IVF. Uh, but in addition, we know, and I just, just to make sure I'm up to date, I just checked the literature on this and it remains the case that my, minority women are more likely to experience infertility for a variety of reasons. And when they do seek treatment, they have worse outcomes. They have pregnancy loss, they have um, uh, difficulties, some morbidity and mortality associated with their IVF course. And so uh, it's not just cost, but there are, there are endemic and other external features that make race and ethnicity interact in a more negative way with ART. Um, and just the final bullet point is that treatment seeking is even lower among um, women of color and men of color than it is um, in other populations. And there, there we could pick apart and we should, the reasons for that. We know that there are insurance disparities, but the interesting thing, and again, maybe Ellie will talk about this, um, in some of the equal access to treatment jurisdictions or areas such as the military, I think we still see treatment seeking, even when the opportunity for treatment access is um, more equal, we still see less seeking among um, uh, patients of color. And part of this is attributed to the well-known and well-documented history of racism in healthcare and mistrust that's been bred as a result in the United States. And then some um, cultural aspects of reproduction and infertility that create stigma, uh, self-stigma in some cases, and racial stereotyping among providers that contributes overall to this access problem. Um, I wonder whether provider conduct contributes to this stratification along race, and, and I think it actually does. Um, a basic tenet of health law, as uh, the lawyers on the call know, is that for the most part, doctors can choose their patients. They, uh, yes, there are, there are civil rights discrimination laws and there are contract obligations, but a tenet of, of the healthcare system is that physicians are free to choose uh, the patients they treat and the patients they don't treat. Again, it's a general matter. And so for me, with that as a baseline, it's important to explore how does Conduct, how does provider conduct interact with access? Um, and here's just some of the findings I've, found, I've, I've noted uh, over the course of my research in this arena. 
Um, generally, practitioners are less likely to refer minority patients for infertility workup. There's a study that looks at um, women presenting with certain symptomology and the women of color generally being referred for hysterectomy or um, other similar treatments, whereas non-women of color are referred for infertility treatment. And, and so that's one factor that we've documented. Another is just geography. The vast majority of ART clinics, and there's about 500 of them in the US, just under, most of them are located in minority white neighborhoods. So even just getting to the doctor is interesting. The book that uh, you mentioned that I did, I actually looked at every single clinic and did a heat map of where the clinics are located. And they're in places like Beverly Hills, um, in New York, on, uh, I don't know New York as well as I know Los Angeles, but in areas that you would expect would have this uh, demography. And that was true across the country. Um, also, I looked at websites uh, and their landing pages and saw that you can see the, the, the landing pages had only white babies featured, mostly um, a heteronormative heterosexual couples as well. Uh, only 16% advertise that they have multilingual providers or can provide assistance. Um, and this is an older study, but it's still worth looking at that 80% um, of the physicians in the field are white. And you can see the, the lower numbers that are in the Hispanic and black communities. Um, that in the last 10 years has changed and has improved, but we have a long way, as you can see, to come given those low numbers even 10 years ago. Um, let's move on and talk about uh, marital status and sexual orientation as barriers to accessing ART. Well, we know there's increasing or really stable births to unmarried uh, um, women in the United States. We don't know if they're unpartnered because that's not the measurement that we're looking at, but about 40% of children are born to unmarried women in the United States. So it's a significant number. About a third of all sperm bank clients are single women. Um, and so we, we get begin to see what the, the population is. But we also know that state laws increasingly allow physicians to refuse treatment to patients based on the physician's sort of conscious objection. It doesn't have to be a really robust objection in some cases. And the, the sort of moral and religious objection clauses are working their way through certain states and allowing physicians to refuse treatment. And so I do worry a lot about how this is going to uh, impact ART. And in terms of laws that protect marital status from discrimination or sexual orientation or gender identity, not, not that many, about half of states um, protected in the state laws. And again, we can talk later about how the federal uh, federalism interacts with those and what protections the states actually do provide. Um, and again, as I say, protection of religious and moral objection from the physician community is gaining ground. Well, you know, you might think, well, we have marriage equality, so it shouldn't really be an issue. If you're a same-sex couple, if you're married, then you should have the marriage presumption and, and all of the rights that go along with that. But my, my research and others, of course, has, has indicated that that's not necessarily the case. Even marriage equality hasn't eliminated some of these access barriers that we experience in um, this realm. So, for example, a lot of the health insurance mandates that, that we talked about, that you read about, um, will only cover medical infertility, not social infertility, that is being in a same-sex relationship or being a single individual. Um, and that access requires, in many cases, six months to a year of heterosexual intercourse without pregnancy um, resulting. Well, that's not the way that many individuals go about their, their sex lives or their reproductive lives. So if the insurance can only kick in, if you have 12 months of unprotected sex, that eliminates many populations from that coverage. There's an interesting class action lawsuit that was uh, brought pretty recently against Aetna based on this, this issue um, in which the um, uh, individuals who don't uh, engage in inter intercourse and in, in heterosexual intercourse were still required to, to, to have a substitute for that in order to be eligible for treatment. They had to go through interuterine insemination as a, a way of kind of mimicking uh, the intercourse process that's required. They had to pay for it, even if it wasn't the most effective treatment, which it's often not. Um, you saw the success rates with IVF at 35%. IUI success rates hover around the 15% range, even lower in some cases. So already you're starting off with a treatment that isn't necessarily going to be clinically effective, and it had to be self-pay. So the, the lawsuit challenges um, this uh, provision based on discrimination and other grounds, and we'll, we'll follow it and see how it 
turns out. Also, gamete donation of surrogacy, of course, is excluded and some, kind, some cases even prohibited under these insurance laws and other laws. So again, being married isn't going to help in that case. Um, and then uh, finally, some of the surrogacy laws limit enforcement of the contracts to married couples in which the wife is unable to carry a pregnancy. Uh, and, and you can you know, just uh, spin out how difficult this would be, for example, same-sex male couples not being able to legalize their um, relationship with the child because of these laws. Uh, I'll move on and talk about disability as a barrier uh, because again, it's, it's significant. Um, we know that there are reported refusals by providers to treat patients with sensory mobility and cognitive disabilities. We know this from um, studies that have looked at it and from some of the lawsuits that have been brought as a result. Uh, look, one survey found 13% of providers are unlikely to treat patients with so-called limited intellectual capacity. There's also, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, there are also what, what I call micro uh, um, aspects of the access picture in which um, physicians will refuse to transfer embryos with known gen genetic anomalies that are detected through PGT. And to me, that's a form of access. And then finally, in the HIV community, um, there's very few clinics, increasing there more, but they're willing to treat HIV-infected individuals. At ASRM, during my time as the, the chair of the ethics committee, we, we wrote um, a number of reports on this and kept trying to survey the clinics that were willing to serve patients and the numbers were very low. I mean, the good news from that end on it in a different way is that treatments are, are um, of course very effective and, uh, and some in, in many cases have alleviated the need for, for IVF or even sperm washing and other techniques, but nevertheless, accessing it is still rather difficult. All right, so let me move then to this sort of other part of uh, what, what I, I call like digging into the access piece or the micro aspects of it. So that is to say, even if an individual has access to IVF or access to insemination, to treatment, within that treatment dyad between the patient and the physician, there are still access barriers that I think are worth investigating. And here you see I've listed the ones I'm gonna talk about here. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, um, we have the question of how many embryos to transfer. Uh, and we have the famous Octomom. I don't know how many of you remember Nadia Suleiman, um, but here she is right before she delivered at Kaiser Permanente, I think near Long Beach. And it, it, again, it set off a lot of discussion about embryo transfer, about responsibility in the IVF community and so on. Um, and by the way, here you see her with her octoblets, um, in, I think la about last year, a year ago. And, and, you know, they are, as you can see, quite healthy. They may have, there might be some long-term issues that I'm not aware of, but for this photo, she did um, an interview in which she talked um, about the loving family that she has and and the health of her children. So in a way, really outperforming, if you will, or, uh, or certainly the odds, but, um, it's an interesting follow-up and it's a lesson to us about prediction as well. In any case, um, surveys indicate that many IVF patients would like to have twins. That is a favored outcome for them. And so there's often debate at the bedside about how many embryos to transfer back into the uterus. And there's an increasing movement toward SCT or single embryo transfer. Um, such that you can have a clash at the, at the Petri dish, as I've called it, where the patients are really wanting to have the twins because sometimes they've reached the end of their financial journey for IVF and they're basically out of funds and certainly emotionally, uh, psychologically, this, physically, this is a very difficult journey. So often physicians refuse uh, to make a double embryo transfer because the, the uh, really the um, the standard of care is that single embryo is best. And, and so that can be a way that access to some extent um, is barred. Um, as I mentioned, the second bullet point, we have made tremendous strides in multiple pregnancy rates dropping from really one in three IVF outcomes to really uh, now under one in 10. Uh, and again, we have a lot of professional urging toward single embryo transfer, despite what patients really want for their outcomes. The PGT is also an interesting and important adventure to talk about. Um, 
in um, we know that through the use of testing, we can detect numerous types of uh, anomalies in uh, in this patterning, whether they're from aneuploidy um, or single gene uh, disorders. We know a lot about embryos through IVF and raises questions about choice and selection. So these are just some points to think about with transferring embryos with known genetic anomalies. Um, again, just talk about parental desire. Um, looking at family pedigrees that are well known to patients, they're sometimes quite accustomed to having um, a disease pattern in their family based on um, a, an anomaly. And they want to move forward with the pregnancy in some cases, particularly in this first bullet point, if there are no so-called normal embryos uh, in a batch or at all, even in a frozen cycle. So patients often do express a willingness to raise an impaired child from a health status point of view because either they're familiar with the disease pattern based on familial um, symptomology or because they simply um, want to take whatever child they have formed through their embryos or through donor embryos and move forward. Um, and, and this dilemma here really does pit, I think, the, the patient and their reproductive autonomy, which again, Justice Douglas spoke so uh, broadly about, and the providers, what I call professional conscience. And I have a slide later on just to investigate that a little more, but having talked over the years to many REIs, reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists, they struggle mightily with this idea of transferring an embryo that they know will produce a child who will have significant health impairments. It's very difficult for them um, to move forward in that way. Although they know that it's not their child and they largely understand it's not their choice, they still feel professionally compromised by assisting in this way. Um, and again, any good lawyer will say that if we do move forward with the transfer, informed consent should be robust and it should include voices from uh, specialists in the disease profile and from the patient community if possible so that the most uh, information possible is, is provided to the patient. Um, the problem of prediction, I mentioned it with the octuplets, but it's also true when it comes to disease profiles. And you know, many diseases, uh, the genotype and the phenotype can be different in that the genotype is stable, but the phenotype can occupy a tremendous range. And I mean, these are just some of the ways in which that's true, whether it's with CF or Downs, um, that, that the, the phenotype is, as you know, very different. And also just what are the chances that there can be breakthroughs in treatment and even cures along the way. We can always hope and we should always be open to that. So to say that a child should not be born with a disease um, really is short-sighted and doesn't look forward to what we can do you know, from a medical and scientific point of view. I said I talked briefly about the, the role of provider autonomy because I, I, I care a lot about what providers think and, and feel in this, in this area. And I feel it's a little bit underserved um, because there's a lot of attention on patient autonomy, which is appropriate. But I always say that providers are entitled to equal dignity and equal humanity in the actions they take in the clinical setting. The AMA supports this. There's lots of language in the AMA um, writings that out, refusal of care for reasons of personal conscience. And um, again, providers who do PGT have talked about the reason they do it is to promote the birth of a healthy child. And so to actually promote the health of the birth of a child who will just most decidedly be unhealthy in some ways is really against um, their professional identity. And the moral distress that, I, again, colleagues have expressed to me that that they feel over these outcomes can be life affecting, lifelong and very burdensome for providers. Uh, at ASRM, we've taken um, some time to think about this and we do have a, an ethics committee opinion that basically says that, that it's, accept, it's ethically acceptable for providers to refuse uh, if they feel that there would be, well, in this paper, serious child rearing deficiencies. Um, and that's really as to the parent's capability, not to the child, him or herself. But again, there are certain lines that when you have the A as part of ART, the assisted, you naturally have third parties involved and their makeup and their preferences are relevant in addition to that of the patients. 
Some of you are probably familiar with the procreative beneficence theory. I'm just putting this in for the, the true ethicists on the call uh, who study this theory. Uh, there are writers who talk about this duty-based admonition um, to uh, produce the best child, or if you will, of, of all of the embryos, that there is a duty to select the embryo that would provide the best life and so on. And again, we could pick this apart for hours. There's many aspects to this that are problematic, but just be known that these theories are at play in the field. Um, just to can't help but just do a little bit of law here. Um, what is the legal landscape for these transfers um, of anomalous embryos. And one of the, um, and this often comes up in this, in this discussion where um, providers will say, well, the patient has agreed to sign a waiver that if I go ahead with the transfer, the patient will waive any liability that I might have for uh, the health of the child moving forward. And as any good lawyer would say, it's worthless. Um, it may be that the patient or the patient's partner or spouse can waive the right to uh, future compensation, but no, no future child's legal rights can be waived. So if the transfer occurs, if the child is impaired, um, in, in many states, the child could or would have a claim against the physician. So waiver is not the answer for physicians. And the damages can be quite extensive. They can be lifelong and they can be staggering for, uh, for the physician or the physician's carrier. And so if you think about it, looking at this from the front end, the liability for refusing to transfer is pretty low. Um, in fact, I don't even know, and, and others might on the call, of a successful lawsuit in which a patient has sued a physician for failing to make a transfer of an anomalous embryo uh, and getting any kind of um, damage, damages out of that versus when the transfers have occurred and the child has been impaired, there are some um, staggering actually uh, tort recoveries in, in those kinds of cases. So just looking ahead, uh, where, where are we going in our field? Well, again, going back to the emerging technologies, it's been over two decades since human embryonic stem cell uh, therapies and possibilities were introduced. And the question is, where have we come with that? And part of the reason I think we haven't come as far as we could is because of the regulatory scheme. And that's a topic for a whole nother um, case. I hope maybe you'll invite me back to, to talk about that. But restrictions in the U.S. have certainly interacted, I would say, negatively with advancing these fields. And so perhaps that has set a, uh, a stage and a ground uh, work for um, access moving forward. That is that it would be highly impacted by a negative regulatory environment. Um, but these new technologies, germline gene editing, um, MRT and IVG, which we spoke about, they um, are moving forward in a, in a different way because they deal more with reproduction than with therapeutic medicine. Um, but still they're facing, as you see, political scientific funding challenges. And, and those, those are well-known and well-described. And again, I think it's no, um, nothing uh, too uncommon to say that should these technologies emerge, they would face the same kinds of barriers that I, I spoke about um, to achieve a true distributive justice environment in the field. And so with that, um, nobody's perfect, but we're working on it. And I thank you so much for this opportunity and look forward to hearing Dr. Adashi's remarks. Okay. Can you see the slides? This looks good, thank you. Looks good. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, thank you for the feedback. As uh, like Judy, I will begin uh, at the beginning uh, of IVF, uh, which um, occurred in 1978 with the birth of Louise Joy Brown, who is shown here in the arms of her mother, Leslie. 
it's interesting in retrospect to realize um, what a modest um, report followed this remarkable event. Uh, it was basically a letter to the editor, which you can see here, barely occupy the page, that referred to this uh, breakthrough that ultimately, before too long, was rewarded by the Nobel Prize. But at the time, it was barely a, a page um, in the Lancet. The United States was a tad behind on IVF. Uh, we finally caught up uh, three years later. Uh, the individuals who were responsible for that breakthrough were Howard and Georgiana Jones, who at the time were in Norfolk at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. Um, this last year, in fact, we were celebrating 40 years of that anniversary. That is to say the birth of Elizabeth Jordan Carr, who was the first American IVF baby, who was displayed on virtually every outlet around the nation from the Boston Globe to Life magazine. And so in that respect, the stage was set and we now had to begin to deal with the consequences of these new technologies in the United States as well. As Judy mentioned, it's generally estimated that about eight to nine million babies worldwide were born as a result of IVF. In terms of access, uh, we are looking at a house divided. In this case, a global house divided, just to illustrate a few of those points. All of this is happening, of course, against the backdrop of what was already alluded to, and that is the right to procreate, which is clearly spelled out in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which dates back to 1948, where in this sentence uh, makes it very plain that uh, procreation is an inherent human right. This notion of procreative liberty could or should in principle translate into the right to infertility care. But that is not always the case because infertility is not invariably defined as a disease and healthcare of course is all about diseases. And that's another struggle this field is continuing to um, try to overcome. It's not as if the notion of infertility as a disease is a novel one. Uh, the World Health Organization is very clear about it. It defines infertility as a disease of the reproductive system, which is defined by the failure to achieve a clinical pregnancy after 12 months or more of regular unprotected intercourse. In fact, the World Health Organization includes female infertility in its international classification of diseases, the so-called ICD classification. That said, uh, the situation still is one wherein the house is divided between those who can access assisted reproduction and those who cannot. A global view, for example, of nations or regions wherein universal health insurance is prevalent reveals that there is a significant variability uh, in the absence or presence of universal health insurance. If you focus on North America, for example, Canada, of course, 
enjoys universal health insurance, but the United States does not. Europe generally has embraced universal health insurance, as did Australia. But as you can tell, there are large swaths of the globe that have yet to embrace universal health insurance. Despite the fact that the World Health Organization is clearly considering universal health coverage as an overarching principle that all nations should abide by. The house is divided, of course, in the United States, which is really where we want to focus in terms of access to the technologies in question. And primarily this concerns the underwriting of infertility care, the provision of resources that would allow Americans to access infertility care. As I mentioned earlier, one major hindrance is the fact that in the United States, in not just many other nations, but in the United States, infertility is not recognized as a disease, the definition of the World Health Organization notwithstanding. The ASRM has sought on multiple occasions to address this issue beginning in 1993 and called for the uh, for the notion of defining infertility as a disease. Uh, that effort was reaffirmed in 2008 and 2013 and quite possibly beyond. But despite that efforts, we have yet to make the kind of progress I think we all hope for. And part of it has to do with the fact that the USFA has a significant streak of what we might call libertarianism, um, even though we are, after all, a pluralist democracy, uh, we are not exactly the same as some of the social democracies of Europe or other parts of the globe. And for the most part, uh, in the US, uh, there has been and remains a sentiment against big government the notion of providing the population with care from cradle to grave, or for that matter, universal health insurance. We have none of the above. You could say that this predominates perhaps the agenda of the Republican Party rather than the Democratic Party. But beyond all of that, it is a streak that runs through, I think, uh, the American psyche or the American worldview. Uh, when you compare it side by side, for example, with the worldview of a Norwegian citizen or a Swedish citizen. And then, of course, we come back to the notion of failure to define infertility, the disease. And we recognize that the poor patient uh, essentially lacks recourse. Neither the public nor the private sector in the United States uh, accept responsibility for the underwriting of infertility care in large measure because they are off the hook. Infertility is not a disease and therefore why should they cover this condition? That's not to say that there is no coverage and we will of course discuss that, but the ground rules to begin with do not favor this outcome. As Judy mentioned, just take one look at the Affordable Care Act, which we generally think of as a progressive, forward-looking law, which defined several so-called essential health benefits, but did not include infertility care in that definition. And so underwriting of infertility care in the United States 
remains an issue. Uh, we have high under and uninsurance rate, high out of pocket costs, absent public payers, limited private payers. And even though we have 19 infertility state mandates, as Judy mentioned, they have substantial limitations, uh, some of which I will point out. Perhaps one way to look at the access to infertility, issue, infertility care issue in the United States is to compare or at least assess the public versus the private sector. On the public side, health insurance in the United States is provided by Medicaid, by Medicare, it's provided by the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program, the VA, and the Indian Health Service. I'll come back to TRICARE a little bit later. And as you will see, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, of course, do not cover infertility care. And when it comes to the Federal Health Employee Benefits and VA and IHS, the same holds true, and I'll be a little bit more specific in the next minute or so. Over the years, there have been efforts to add IVF coverage to the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plans. As you know, federal employees who are spread all over the country um, are generally attached to various health plans, but the determination of the benefits is uh, central and comes from Washington. Several senators and representatives over the years, this is a little bit dated, but there really hasn't been any activity since, uh, advanced bills to add IVF to the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plans, but have failed to do so. None of these bills have been enacted. When it comes to the VA, the situation is difficult. We have 10 million beneficiaries who still have to abide by the so-called Veterans Health Care Act of 1992 wherein the Secretary of Veteran Affairs may provide women the following health services, except not including, that is, under this section, infertility services. In a word, the VA is prohibited by law from providing infertility benefits to appropriate beneficiaries despite the fact that these individuals risk their lives on behalf of the nation, et cetera, et cetera. There have been efforts to correct this circumstance as is shown here, but here again, none of these bills have at any point been enacted. Senator Patty Murray, who has been an advocate for infertility care and has made significant contributions to this arena, at least was able through an amendment she introduced in 2016 to see to it that individuals who were seriously injured uh, in the line of duty were in fact able to receive care. TRICARE is a little different. There are about 9.5 active members who receive their benefits from TRICARE. And TRICARE interestingly subsidizes ART for all its beneficiaries, which is to say it doesn't cover everything, but it provides hefty subsidies. In 2013, which is the last year I could get figures for, there were 1,200 ART cycles under TRICARE at an out-of-pocket cost of less than $7,000 per cycle, which is less than you would pay in the private sector, but by no means is uh, covering the costs in full. At least what TRICARE does, it covers ART for so-called wounded warriors, individuals who were so seriously injured that their fertility was compromised 
And for those individuals, the entire cost of the entire bill is covered. These are severely injured service members. Moving now to the private sector, US private underwriting, which is dominated by self-insured employer-sponsored plans has existed uh, at varying percentages over the years. You can see it here through approximately 2013. And when it comes to IVF, uh, the data are mostly to be found in surveys that uh, are conducted by Mercer, a human resources consulting firm. When you plot those data from 2005 to 2020 and examine IVF benefits by employer size, you realize that the larger the employer, the more likely the employee is to be covered uh, in terms of their IVF benefits. Also, larger employer are more likely to cover not necessarily IVF, but a visit to the reproductive endocrinologist, the drug costs that may be necessary before IVF or during IVF, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and they will more likely cover what is known as superovulation with intrauterine insemination, which is a fertility promotion uh, therapy that precedes IVF before one actually moves to IVF. It's also interesting to note that there is a certain region of variation in the provision of coverage by uh, private employers. It seems that in the Northeast, uh, one is most likely to enjoy IVF benefits as compared with the West, South, and Midwest. The reasons are not entirely clear, although we can speculate on why that is so, but um, those are the numbers. Here again, uh, the region you live in has a lot to do with whether or not the benefits will include a visit with the reproductive endocrinologist, whether the benefits will include the coverage of drug costs or the coverage of superovulation with IUI. As for the infertility mandates, uh, I will be brief uh, in that they are highly heterogeneous. Not all of them, in fact, cover IVF. In fact, a minority of them cover IVF. But even if they do, the benefits are quite limited. We have recently submitted a paper yet to be published on the real life benefits of the Massachusetts mandate, which is generally thought of as generous and advanced and enlightened. And it is all of the above. But when it comes right down to it, you can see that in Massachusetts, public health plans, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, and the federal employee health benefits are exempted from the mandate by dint of federal or state statutes. In addition, uh, self-insured employer-sponsored health plans, as already was mentioned, are exempted from the mandate by dint of ERISA. So when it's all said and done, and we've quantified that, it follows that only 26 to 36 percent of state-based reproductive age women comprised eligible beneficiaries of the mandate in Massachusetts over the 2016-2019 interval. So really just one in three reproductive age women effectively ends up benefiting from the Massachusetts mandate. And the situation could well be worse in other states which provide that benefit. And then, as I mentioned, so many other health mandates don't even cover IVF. Another 
issue that obviously divides us and has an impact on our conversation is the pro-life, pro-choice debate. Uh, in the United States, uh, which is increasingly uh, one of the last nations on earth to be preoccupied by that issue, uh, we have a problem when it comes to IVF, we have a problem when it comes to human embryo research or human embryo loss. As far as research is concerned, you're probably familiar with the Dickey Wicker Amendment, which uh, has been with us since 1996 and is religiously attached to the appropriation bills to HHS and NIH year in and year out. It prohibits the creation of a human embryo for research purposes or research in which human embryo is destroyed, discarded, or knowingly subjected to risk of injury or death. This does not directly affect IVF, but the implications are clear. Um, we have a very different outlook in the United States on some of these issues, and the bearing on IVF is inevitable. They are, in addition to that, uh, ideologically motivated interventions. We had a few state personhood amendments over the years, all of which have failed, to my knowledge, but um, indicate the ongoing unrest amongst a segment of the population that feels very uncomfortable with state with the um, IVF. The George Bush administration, interestingly, had a major embryo adoption initiative, again, with an eye towards diminishing, hopefully, embryo loss, and in keeping with the view of that administration of the sanctity of human life uh, as viewed from a religious point of view. Um, so-called off-the-grid sanctuary or saving grace of IVF is the fact that so much of the coverage as you have seen so far is in the private sector, which is perhaps less preoccupied with these issues. I would also say that all these constraints notwithstanding, there is widespread public acceptance of IVF in that we all value substantially, of course, uh, the ability to procreate and to establish a family. And so the public as a whole supports the notion of promoting fertility. And although it's not publicly recognized or stated, we can safely assume that many of our congressmen and senators have either benefited individually and personally from IVF or failing that may have observed the same in members of their family, possibly their children. And so there is a certain um, um, implicit support that is not articulated openly, but which nevertheless exists and almost certainly allows IVF to operate to this day without any direct restrictive uh, legislation. What we need to do going forward, of course, is to define infertility as a disease, uh, overcome these other issues mostly the uneven underwriting policies and hopefully evolve the social cultural norms and the raging moral debates that are currently plaguing this field. More specifically, every so often we get good news like the Pentagon would offer, uh, has offered to store eggs and sperm to retain young troops. We realize as Judy said, that large companies such as Apple and Facebook offered to freeze eggs for female employees. Citibank and JP Morgan Chase 
that followed suit. And when you look at egg freezing benefits uh, back in 2015 anyway, again, it seemed like in the Northeast, those benefits were more likely than in other parts of the country. What we can do going forward is take the following steps if we can. First of all, we need to reach a consensus on infertility as a disease. And it would help if the Department of Health and Human Services took the lead in that undertaking. Second, we need to advocate for infertility underwriting by employer-sponsored plans. Uh, employers begin to recognize the utility of this uh, benefit in terms of recruiting and retaining high quality employees, especially high quality female employees. But there are still uh, things to do. Uh, from the employer point of view, it's not only um, the right thing to do, it's really the smart thing to do because it attracts and retains valuable employees, promotes a family friendly brand, reduces healthcare costs in terms of plural birth, tracks at less than $4 per member per month, and constitutes 1.5% really of the total health benefit costs. Third thing we may wanna do is update infertility state mandates, which we mentioned have, a lot, have left a lot to be desired. Four, we may wanna press Congress to address the issue at the federal level, fund IVF for everybody in TRICARE, fund IVF for all in the federal employee health benefit plans and repeal the VA infertility ban, which has now been around since 1992. There have been some effort along the way. This is an old sponsored bill by the late Representative Lewis and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand to amend the IRS code to provide tax credit for the cost of infertility treatment. This bill has not been enacted, but we need more of that kind of legislative initiative to really advance the cause. And finally, we need to explore and develop low-cost IVF options, so-called low-cost IVF. Already mentioned was the notion of uh, in vitro gametogenesis and other new technologies, whether or not they'll actually pan out in terms of being more affordable, of course, remains to be seen. They should, because there will mostly be laboratory-based procedures. Uh, one will no longer require uh, injections to stimulate egg production, and um, the whole role of the clinician will have to be entirely reevaluated under those new circumstances. And that's coming. And so, as we struggle to uh, bring some sense and sensibility to the coverage of IVF, the technology is changing. Um, it may not happen tomorrow, but it will happen in our lifetime. And so several things are happening all at once. And as usual, we're not given the, um, the benefit of planning uh, and sort of carefully adjusting to a new situation. Um, it's going to be a bumpy ride, I think is probably the way I should end this. And uh, hopefully uh, we can discuss this some more uh, at the later point in this, uh, in this uh, context. So thank you very much again. So thank you both for wonderful presentations that were hopefully really informative for the audience. Um, I'll kick us off first with a quick question here. Um, so my question for you both is with the possible overturning of Roe v. Wade looming, at least seemingly, 
Um, do you anticipate that future state laws that restrict abortion access may have an impact on ART policies? Um, so for example, one thing I'm thinking of is, do you think, for instance, it'll become less common to implant multiple embryos if selective reductions can no longer be performed? Judy, you want to take that first? Sure. Thank you, B. That's a great question. And it's one that I know I've been thinking about, and I'm sure others as well. So as Elliot laid out, there's a really interesting relationship between ART and abortion. And I mean, if you just look at them positionally, that you can understand why. Um, ART is about family formation, about engaging in reproduction, and abortion is about avoiding reproduction. So it's an uneasy relationship because of the aims, but at their heart, they do involve the same time periods and the same materials, if you will, at stake. So with that sort of said, um, the I think the way in which the overturning of Roe could impact ART uh, is by uh, giving more space and oxygen to the possibility of more heavy regulation on the clinical practices themselves. So for example, there would be more energy toward per prohibiting cryopreservation, that all the cycles have to be fresh cycles because the notion is that by freezing the embryos, many of which are unused and re either remain in frozen storage or are thought and discarded is somehow similar to an abortion because the movement is of course uh, steeped in the notion that, and I don't wanna generalize and I, I know everyone has wide range of views, but there is a sort of a dominating narrative that life begins at conception and we need to protect life from the earliest moments. And so that might include not putting embryos in uh, frozen suspension for decades. Cause we, have, we do have embryos that have been frozen since 19, the 19, early 1990s. So that might be one way, no prior preservation. We also might get laws that say no PGT, no interaction with the embryos um, at, at uh, the earliest moments because PGT does involve a manipulation. Uh, right now, the technology is that the trophectoderm, the portion of the embryo that will become the placenta is usually the portion that is involved in PGT. We've moved away from the actual inner cell mass, um, but, we're, but we're moving uh, still, and we might even be moving to actually just looking at the culture media, and hopefully we will. But in any case, the point being that as there's more acceptability of protecting embryos at the earliest moments, then some of the things we do in IVF would not be acceptable to, um, to individuals. That said, and here's just makes it interesting and complicated. As Ellie said, when you poll legislators about this issue, many of them either personally or through connections no IVF, they've used it, they have families that have used it and so on. So they're really reluctant to get involved with uh, prohibiting IVF. So while they're all about uh, life begins at conception, let's ban abortion, they're not as ready to say, well, let's slow down or even interact negatively with IVF. So that's more, that doesn't answer your question. It just gives you a way that, that I think I'm certainly thinking about this area. I mean, I, I think that sums it up very well. Uh, I, all I would say is that uh, state legislators have not lacked in imagination. Uh, just look at the Mississippi abortion law or the Texas abortion law and uh, more that are coming as we speak, of course, in almost, I don't know how many state legislatures. At the same time, um, you know, it's impossible to predict, of course, because of what we said about the fact that many legislators, whether they admit it or not, whether they uh, discuss it in public or not, they have benefited from or relied on IVF directly or indirectly. I would only comment about the notion of no freezing that that's not going to be all that workable, really, even for the imaginative legislator, because invariably we end up with more than one embryo. Uh, we may have 10, we may have 12. Okay, so if we don't freeze them, what do we do? I mean, one way or the other, they will be destroyed. 
if they're not frozen, they will be destroyed, in fact. By being frozen, they will be preserved uh, and give rise to future life. So uh, I think that would be self-defeating if I were a pro-life legislator. So it's kind of hard to read the mind of uh, those legislators, certainly at this point. All I would say is, just like I said at the beginning, uh, imagination runs wild. Uh, uh, if you end up in an abortion law that allows vigilantes to uh, preclude uh, women from proceeding to have an abortion, anything's possible. So I hate to predict. Thank you both. That was extremely helpful, at least for me, and kind of I've been thinking about this a lot. There's a question from um, one of the audience members who's, it's in the same vein, so I'll go ahead with this next. Um, and this person's wondering whether or not there's any sort of discernible consistency or pattern with those 19 states that do have um, insurance coverage mandates in terms of whether or not that aligns with their legislative positions respectively on abortion rights. Um, do either of you know if there's a pattern there? I think that would be interesting, especially with, you know, the future of Roe looming. Yeah, I, I'd have to actually look this up. I, that never really occurred to me as, as such. Um, so many of these mandates are clearly in the Northeast. Um, uh, the first one was in Maryland. Uh, Massachusetts was next. And of course, you have one in Connecticut, New Jersey, eventually New York, I believe. Um, Illinois would, would take us closer to the center of the nation. California, of course. Um, but I've never really made that effort. Maybe Judy knows whether or not uh, the proclivity of the state uh, had something to do with the nature of the mandate. That's a great question. And like Ellie, I can't answer that specifically, but just make a couple of comments about that. Um, I think the states are one that are more geared toward communitarianism and public health, the way that Ellie described, that they're more um, likely to take up the mantle of providing benefits um, under the notion that the state has a responsibility to let their citizens live their best lives, if you will. And so in that way, you see the distribution patterns that you do. But, you know, if you think about it, the states that have the most rigorous, restrictive abortion laws, and we'll see coming forward what that looks like, you could say are the most pronatalist. <laughs> they have the, the most to say about, uh, about family formation and so should be the biggest advocates for IVF coverage. Um, it's just the troubling intersection of the way in which IVF babies are formed and the pronouncements against IVF by the church and others that really interact with that direct tie from pronatalism to support of IVF. Um, so shifting gears a bit, um, a few people were asking about this idea of insurance coverage and allocating funds. Um, so one question, for example, is even if there is a right to procreate, shouldn't there be a prioritization of sorts, especially if public funds are used? So for example, they gave the Octomom example and how she had already had multiple children before using IVF. Um, two other related questions. One is about whether or not in terms of medical tourism, people are going overseas due to cost barriers. And another is kind of just questioning the justification for having coverage of IVF by health insurance in the first place, um, given kind of the need to cover other services for people who are very sick. You want to tackle that, Judy? Sure. So, uh, you know, the big question about prioritizing IVF, particularly in a zero sum game that we live in in the United States um, health care puzzle, you know, that's difficult. And for those of us who dwell in this area and we really see the import and we see the meaning that it has in people's lives and the intimacy with which they interact with this issue and uh, the legacy issues, you know, I, I can't help it myself, you know, as a, as a tax paying citizen be be an advocate for this as a as a priority but i but i understand 100% the limitations and the other priorities and others would feel equally passionately about the public you know interceding and helping in other ways so i i defer i really have to defer on that the tourism question is interesting 
Um, and the U.S. is the source of tremendous importation and exportation of patients uh, for assisted reproductive technologies. Um, on the export side, and be the questioners are, are right, there are many, and I don't know that we can, we don't track it, and it would be difficult to track. We have many um, patient, prospective patients who leave the U.S. for uh, treatment abroad, a lot of them because of third-party reproduction, that they're looking for a donor, particularly donor eggs, and, opt and oftentimes gestational surrogacy, and those services can be much less expensive abroad. And there's a whole market advertising. I mean, if you Google IVF holiday, I, I last check, I think there were hundreds of thousands, there may be millions now of hits, and there's just a tremendous market in, in that way. But at the same time, we also import, if you will, um, patients to the United States because of particularly some of the states that have very um, favorable legal structures. California, where I spent most of my career before moving to Kentucky, but in California, we used to say we were surrogacy central, where over half of all of the surrogacy uh, pre-birth orders in the California courts were from international patients. And so because of that, we also have uh, an importation now it's not stratified along socioeconomic lines in the sense that the patients we import usually have means, have tremendous means, and that's why they're able to come into the U.S. So overall, I just wanted to give a bit of a picture about tourism, um, both how, how we visit and how we welcome fertility tourists uh, in the United States. The only minor, relatively minor point I would add to that is that in terms of uh, importing tourism, uh, there are also clinics in California that would be user-friendly when it comes to sex selection, which seems quite important to some of our visitors from the Far East. So wealthy couples from that part of the world, not infrequently will make it to the West Coast and and seek uh, assistance when it comes to uh, the selection of their sex of their offspring. Um, so I think that too is a form of, you might say, in, uh, reverse tourism, medical tourism uh, that uh, exists in the United States. Again, I don't have numbers. I don't really know that this is a huge sector or anything of the sort, but it exists. So um, unfortunately we're, we're at the end of our time and uh, I know we have a couple other questions, but this, is, this has really been a great discussion. Thank you both so much for such detailed remarks and, and thoughtful commentary on this issue and, uh, and giving us all a lot to think about. Um, we are going to, uh, so, uh, and thanks also to B for, for, um, for moderating. And, and, uh, and so we're gonna um, reconvene next month for our final Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium. Um, we are gonna uh, welcome Jim Kim, who's the former head of the World Bank to talk about um, ethical issues in providing funding for uh, public health issues around the world. Um, but uh, thank you one more time to, to Drs. Adashi and, and Judith Dar for, uh, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Everyone be well. Mm -hmm.